you, Katerina, and welcome to everyone. Welcome to our speakers and to the audience uh, with the panel, How Can Democracy Reinvent Itself in the Digital Age? Um, and uh, this is co-hosted with Forum 2000. So information technologies and social media have altered politics to an extent probably not seen since the addition of the printing press or radio and television. Or maybe better, have just begun to alter politics because they're by far not at the end of the path. In a way, it has brought us much closer together. And yet, on the other hand, it has helped to create information and opinion bubbles. It has polarized society and thereby logically presents new challenges to democracy. So the overriding questions today are, how can tolerance and compromise regain popularity? How can disinformation be fought? And how can resilience against disinformation and hate speech be strengthened? So I think we have the best panel I could imagine with participants representing the sectors of policymaking, civil society, and the corporate world. And uh, more specifically, let me introduce our five uh, speakers for today. Um, it's Claudia Luciani, who is Director for Human Dignity, Equality and Governance at the Council of Europe. We have Anna Herold, Head of Audiovisual and Media Services Policy Unit in the European Commission. We've got Marietje Schake, who is the Director of the Institute for Human-Centered Artificial Intelligence and the President of the Cyber Peace Institute and a former member of the European Parliament. We have Aura Salla, who is uh, the head of policy at Facebook. And last but not least, Saskia van Uffelen, who is GFI Corporate Vice President, uh, a colleague that I understand is the digital champion in Belgium. And um, we uh, have agreed to stick to just about three minutes each for the initial round of uh, questions. And, uh, and then we take it from there. We will have uh, a more lively debate, maybe follow-up questions from me and so on. So without further ado, Claudio Luciani, what is the connection between human dignity and the digital sphere? The floor is yours. <laughs> Thank you very much and uh, greetings from Strasbourg. Um, I wish I was in Prague with some of you, but uh, here it is. Now, your panel is, is extremely interesting. When we saw the, um, the title, we uh, thought that maybe there's a few things we wanted to say. Uh, now, let me start by saying that uh, we have had a clear recognition of uh, the name of the title, that is that uh, there is a certainly, as you said, the disillusionment with formal political institutions. But political participation is on the rise. This is what the economist, uh, economist Index tells us. Uh, participation is on the rise in about every region of the world, and the population is actually uh, called into action. Uh, and the women's participation, uh, speak about dignity and human dignity, women's participation is on the rise. Now, as you have announced it, uh, this is a lot done through social media and technology that have been huge amplifier of such expressions of protest, but also participation. Now, the good size, uh, side of it is that, of course, such technology uh, can help uh, broaden the space for democratic representation by decentralizing information systems and communication platforms that can improve the way in which citizens and society receive and collect information about political processes, help them to participate um, remotely, uh, even let's think about real remote parts of our world. And, and provide feedback to politicians. So there is huge advantages when it comes to democracy. There's big advantages when it comes to uh, also governance, because many, uh, for instance, artificial intelligence systems uh, help with accountability, with responsiveness, efficiency. But as we know, at the same time, you have introduced this. Uh, such systems can be used in a way that maybe unintentionally or intentionally hamper uh, democracy. So, we need to be very vigilant. Now, what can be done about this? Uh, two things. One is to reinforce, actually, traditional democracy. 
need to make sure representative democracy is strong, that institutions are functioning, that uh, checks and balances are functioning, that elections are free and fair, and they represent a do real, very true moment of choice. Now, there are indications that uh, this is what citizens want to They want to vote. You have seen the latest turnout in both the European Parliament, uh, more recently the US elections. When there are stakes, people turn out to the vote. So we must make sure that we remain very vigilant about all those fundamental um, tenets of representative democracy. But of course, this happens only once every four or five years. So secondly, we must uh, ensure that the new technologically facilitated forms of democracy and participation are themselves subject to some degree of democratic control. In other words, they should not escape a democracy test themselves in order to be for the other democracy. The two forms of democracy are enforcing each other. In fact, we have seen in countries that when participatory democracy is, is tends to be higher, representative democracy is strengthened. So there is a very of course, uh, for the latter, for the technological facilitated forms of democracy, we don't have rules. Um, we don't have rules, uh, and we need to have rules. So, at the Council of Europe, and I went with that, we are, for instance, working uh, collectively with all our member states and the EU and other international organizations on a set of fundamental binding rules, for instance, that would uh, encapsulate the fundamental rights that. Uh, uh, citizens should have when it comes uh, to application, for instance, of artificial intelligence to democracy. So there is a beginning of realization that all of this cannot happen without a set of rules. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, also sticking to the time. Um, let me now turn to Anne Herold from the European Commission. Mm, and uh, let's start talking about big tech called big tech, you know, the Google, Facebook, um, and other technology companies that, uh, uh, you know, have more and more become the target of uh, criticism um, uh, and, and, of course, are more and more powerful, uh, no question about it. So uh, my question to you, Anna, would be, um, is big tech then an enemy of democracy? or rather a partner in strengthening democracy's resilience. Over to you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Of course, it's, uh, you know, it's one of these uh, one million dollar questions that you are here putting on the table. But I think it's also one of the questions that we certainly should be asked, increasingly asking ourselves, considering that I think we have uh, seen um, uh, very clearly how important uh, online platforms, social media, uh, or as you call the big tech companies, are in a way, you know, to um, enable us, all of us, uh, all citizens, uh, to be able in an informed way participate in uh, in democracy and all the you know democratic processes. Huge and. Uh, uh, without giving you know a very straightforward answer to you to you to your very big question, I think that what we can say from the European perspective is, is that we are extremely uh, keen on on continuing uh, our increase our continued effort uh, um, to work together with uh, those companies uh, to indeed make sure that our democracies um, can, can uh, remain or become actually more resilient to all the new threats we have seen, you know, with the processes and with what already was mentioned, you know, partly in your introduction and also um, by the previous speaker. So just to give you a few examples, um, I, I think that, um, you know, Everybody knows, and in particular, uh, we have the pleasure to have uh, Aura with us that knows us very well. Um, we have a very positive example of engagement with uh, certain um, tech companies uh, that led to the um, code of practice on disinformation. As you know, this has been recently assessed. 
uh, by the Commission and we have come to the conclusion that um, it is a preliminary conclusion that, you know, that it really contributed um, uh, decisively, you know, to, to, to fighting this uh, information online. Uh, it had some lasting impacts also on some policies, eh? because I think Aura will, will, will explain this to us hopefully in a minute, but it really had an impact on, on how the terms and conditions uh, um, look like and what in practice um, uh, the signatories of the code actually are doing to fight this information. Um, at the same time, I think what is what 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 we, the European Union and Europe, are particularly sensitive to. And I'm pretty sure that the following speakers will will join me in in, in underlying this. Is of course that all of it is an import. All these actions by 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 companies have of course um, an important impact on this careful balancing uh, between you know trying to protect or empower our citizens vis-a-vis um, -vis their interactions with social media and, of course, freedom is extremely dear to us. So I, I think that the, the, the way the European approach um, has been to, to try to see indeed big tech companies as partners in this dialogue, but also to try as much as possible to avoid that these decisions about, you know, how these policies are shaped uh, and in the end, you know, how information um, are taken on the basis of very clear, um, you know, public rules. Uh, and also that there is a clear oversight over it, uh, public oversight. So I think that, you know, the, in this debate, I think the EU has been clearly um, uh, towards uh, clear preference for, for public enforcement vis-a-vis -vis private enforcement. So I think that's has been the leitmotiv of the revision of our audiovisual rules, uh, where we have tried to put uh, in place a clear core regulatory framework where it is still up to the you know to, to the companies to provide funds, but there is a clear framework and also a clear uh, idea what standards we want to see observed on the on the on the platforms and a clear oversight over it and this will continue and it will be uh, again a light motive of the upcoming reforms uh, that you know that we are all uh, eagerly uh, awaiting um, a new framework for platforms enhanced uh, responsibility for platforms under the digital services act um, that we are currently preparing and um, further um, legislative actions that will be set up uh, in the European Democracy Action Plan. Okay, thank you very much, Anna. Um, so, a kind of public-private partnership that we're talking about here. Uh, let me now turn to Mauritius Schaker. And we talked about um, uh, the question of, of big tech, so to speak. But I, let, me, let me talk a little bit more closely about um, two technologies that have emerged. Um, or are about to emerge, uh, artificial intelligence and big data. Uh, it, how, how do you see uh, their impact on uh, the democracy question? Are uh, artificial intelligence and big data uh, friends or foes of democracy? Are the risks or the promises uh, more prominent? Over to you. Thank you so much. And it's a pleasure to join the discussion. Um, I think we have to keep in mind that no matter what technology, no outcome is inevitable. We have seen a lot of hope of positive effects, particularly on democracy, when the open internet, mobile technology, but also social media platforms first emerged. And the promise was so appealing that it discouraged democratic lawmakers in the US, but also in Europe, from putting in place the proper regulations to make sure that uh, independently or unintendedly these new technologies that were disruptive by default would not disrupt democracy. And I think we only need to look at the United States over the past year, months, days, hours to see how dramatic the new vulnerability to democracy 
is linked to the amount of connectivity and the reliance on big tech. Now, you mentioned emerging technology, artificial intelligence and big data. I'm afraid uh, we're, we, we're already more than a little bit pregnant. You know, it's, it's already among us. Big data is there. Artificial intelligence is there. Uh, we cannot look to the future and wonder where the new technology is coming from. It is a part of almost every aspect of people's lives and our economies. And that's what makes, I would say, the governance question over AI, data flows, infrastructure, security, rights protections, so urgent. And for me, in relation to democracy particularly, one aspect has been under uh, analyzed in many ways. And I would say it's the question of the legitimacy to govern. So how come in societies where the rule of law is often hard fought, uh, you know, we are competing online, but with our minds, we are in Prague. Uh, and uh, I think uh, many people in, in uh, the Czech Republic, uh, but also in many other parts of the EU, uh, have in their own lifetimes fought for democracy in ways that we really wish to never see repeated in terms of how uh, hard it can be to defend those fundamental values, to defend the rule of law, and to defend fundamental freedoms. And unfortunately, some of these fights that we thought we could leave in the past are back with a vengeance. And so um, the need to make sure that uh, we are not allowing private companies to govern over the essential layers of our lives, the layer of data, the layer of artificial intelligence, the layer of technology, but rather to make sure that it's anchored in rule of law principles and democratic frameworks, I think it's probably one of the most urgent questions for how democracy will progress or rather degress if we're not careful. And so the legitimacy question and the question of why we have accepted private advertising, digital company, corporate governance over the very infrastructure of our lives, of our democracies, I think needs to be answered urgently. And I personally think we need a dramatic balancing uh, against privatized governance for public interest governance um, against the rule of wardroom for the rule of law, uh, against efficiency and profit aims for uh, questions of protecting minorities, uh, checks and balances, uh, independent research and oversight, and uh, the specific aspects of AI and, and data and make it even harder than it already was with other technologies. So I'll end there, but I think uh, we have to start answering these questions from the starting point of the deep desire to wish to protect democracy and not from the starting point of the inevitability or the um, deterministic outcomes that these technologies might bring. Nothing is inevitable. We've learned those lessons in Europe and if we want democracy to survive, we have to govern. For it. Yeah, very clear statement, Marita. Thank you so much. I have one follow-up question concerning China. I mean, we, we are, we have, you know, the things like the social credit system in China, which gives every citizen or is about to give every citizen a score, which gets better or worse according to uh, which people they talk to, how many uh, speeding fines they uh, they collect with their cars, um, whether they're uh, they're trustworthy on their credit and so on. Uh, you know, isn't that an external threat? to our uh, uh, perception of democracy and individual rights, uh, but our legislation has no, has no, uh, um, no, no, no direct chance of, uh, of regulating this. I mean, this comes from the outside. This comes from the soon-to-be economic power number one. How do we deal with uh, this phenomenon and also the use of artificial intelligence in, uh, in the People's Republic of China? Well, thank you for bringing it up. Uh, I think uh, in China, but also in other more authoritarian uh, regime governed systems, we can see how successfully uh, these regimes have managed to instrumentalize technology uh, to serve their governance models. In the case of China for top-down control, uh, but also the development of the AI industry as such. 
And so I really wish that there would be more attention for the human rights violations as a result of these surveillance systems, which, by the way, also appear in our own societies. Uh, you know, it's not like our societies are free of systematic surveillance and then China is the only uh, country that does it. It's just that the consequences are different uh, for people and the rights protections are much weaker in a country like China. But the idea that there's nothing we can do um, uh, about these technologies flooding our market or being, uh, being invested in, in uh, developing economies like those in Africa and Southeast Asia is, of course, uh, not true. There's a lot that we can do, but it begins with appreciation for the stakes that are very, very high uh, and for a urgent uh, need on the European part to marry geopolitical aspirations and to turn them into practice and to actually have the, the technological aspects of foreign policy, whether it be trade, whether it be national security uh, or human rights much more prominently integrated into what the EU seeks to advance in the world, how it wants to protect its values and how it wants to protect its interests. And I think we can see emerging examples of foreign direct investment screening in Europe, uh, the discussion around 5G and network technologies uh, and, and how they can be uh, put in line with national security concerns. Uh, but I think the EU is, is lagging behind in understanding the pace with which uh, China is advancing both its technology sector and its geopolitical aspirations. And it's important that uh, the EU is more able uh, to forcefully defend uh, and, and promote our values and our interests. And uh, the question is whether we will find in the US a better ally that we've had in the last four years. Um, but in any case, uh, Europe should not depend on others to make sure that it can play this role, which I think a lot of people in the world, civil society organizations, populations, uh, are, are really hoping the EU will, will be successful at. Yeah, it's a, it's a question to be discussed whether the last four years were a low point or uh, whether we uh, haven't seen the end of it. But um, <clears throat> let me now turn to Arasala. Um, big tech companies have been mentioned before. <clears throat> uh, let me also switch the debate a little bit to the conservative side of the political spectrum, uh, from which we've had uh, massive criticism recently uh, against companies such as Twitter, such as Facebook, such as Google, for actually censoring free speech. Um, how would you respond? Um, you know, one of those prominent uh, critics that uh, that put forward these views is the still uh, president of the United States, Donald Trump. So how would you respond to the criticism that what um, big tech are doing right now as we speak amounts to censorship? Okay, thank you so much. And first of all, I want to thank, uh, thank you for having me here today. And uh, I'm looking very much forward to this debate. But let me, let me start saying that this claim is not only unproven but public, uh, publicly available data on Facebook on our own platform actually shows that exact opposite uh, is true. Uh, conservative news uh, regularly ranks among some of the most, no, I wouldn't say most popular, but popular content on our sites. And uh, our aim is to give everyone a voice and uh, like we are the advocates of freedom of speech and no matter what your political views might be or uh, which party you represent or which causes you advocate so we take this kind of accusations of political bias made against us extremely seriously uh, our policies and how we apply them um, can have huge impact so we have a responsibility to apply them uh, evenly and without wavering any side, without devaluing the principle of freedom of expression. Uh, while we believe in free speech, there are critical uh, exceptions, of course. Uh, we don't allow content that might encourage offline harm or is intended to intimidate, uh, exclude or silence people or any, any groups. We have clear and publicly uh, available community standards where you can find the rules for our platforms and we work to slow and reduce the spread of content like a deep, deep
debunked hoaxes and clickbait by uh, downranking it in, in, in our new ways. We know we need to listen more and to be work to strike the right balance with these policies. And we are very much waiting for the Commission's proposals on the DSA and the European Democracy Action Plan. Because let me emphasize that uh, we welcome regulation. Uh, what comes to content, what comes to defining harmful, uh, illegal, unlawful content online, because even we have our community standards. We think that we should have some rules at the European level, uh, European wide rules. And also, let me thank the Commission because you have been, we have had a really good cooperation. With the code of practice, the code of practices uh, in every level. However, now we are very much looking forward to having democratic discussion with uh, European policymakers in the European Parliament, European Council, and in member states. So, a short follow-up question. Thank you, uh, thank you, Aura. Short follow-up question to you. Uh, then. Explain to me why is Mark Zuckerberg such a hate figure for for many many people in Europe and America? Well, that's an interesting and very personal question. I I would say uh, I cannot answer to that. Uh, for me, uh, he is an advocate of freedom of speech, and also not only that, he has given us a voice to people uh, in those places in the world where people privileged having a voice. Yes, the company has grown enormously uh, in a very short time period. We need to remember that. And I can assure you that we are doing our very best, uh, like tackling some harmful content or behaviors on online. However, uh, joining this company, I have all also learned that there is a good will and aims behind uh, all this. So that's why we are here also engaging with you today, talking about democracy, because we want to do more and we want to do better. And uh, that's why also I was emphasizing that uh, we welcome this really good cooperation with the EU institutions and also democratic decision, decision makers in member states. Thank you very much. Let me now turn to uh, Saskia van Uffelen. And uh, Saskia, thanks for being here. Um, I would say digital is more than technology. What other challenges and opportunities do we have in our digital future? Over to you. Thank you, uh, Prague, for being in this fantastic, uh, mostly female uh, panel. This doesn't happen often, so uh, thank you for that uh, occasion. Um, I'm here with a double role. I'm here as operational uh, manager as corporate VP for an IT company at one side, and at the other hand, I'm representing the Belgian federal government to help to roll out digital agenda in a fast but safe um, uh, mode. So I will try to make some parallels between between both between government and 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 industry. And the first thing is, like you said, when when we are talking about digital, you asked about AI, um, and, and I think uh, Marietje said it correctly. It's not a future technology. I think we need to realize that we are already living in a world where everything and everybody is connected. And lucky we are, because in the world we are living because of the pandemic, we still have roads, we still have our buildings, and we can still use it to do this, to do these kind of events. But the fact that everything and everybody is already co uh, connected has a major impact on society because it's turning the society upwards down. And I will speak now as a, as a CEO, I'm a CEO myself. Before, it was me defining what my customers would buy after three years. But today, it's my customers who say, no, 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 no I don't want to have that stuff. I would like to have that one. I want to have it delivered at my home, and it should be this weekend. So we need to be agile. We need to be flexible to adapt to the, to the customer's demand. And those companies, some of them prove it during this very difficult period to reinvent themselves and to really start focusing on the customer. And in policy, it's the same. In politics, it's the same thing. It's not the citizens have to do. The citizens have a lot of information, fake news or correct news, but they think that they are better than whatever governmental policy can do. 
And that is something I think we do underestimate uh, today in the culture we are living. It has a major impact on the roles of, of organizations and management in organizations, but it has also, you could also hear the question, what is the role of a government going forward? Because in the past, it was there to serve the citizens. Now you can ask the question, is this still valid going forward? Or should we really, we, we've talked about public, partner, uh, public partnerships, should we, should we a little bit rethink about the role of the governments and also the role of, of Europe? Eh? I have the occasion of working with Europe. Sometimes I compare it, and apologies for direct comparison, but I sometimes compare it with the complexity of the government in Belgium. Because I have a lot of silos, and me as a citizen, I do not understand anymore. And that's maybe talking about democracy, that citizens do not follow anymore. They, they do not buy in your stuff anymore. And you have this exactly the same in an organization. If, you do not, if you're not clear and very crisp on where you want to go, and all have the same voice, I will be very alone as a management and I will not have my employees with myself. And I think we need to use the technology to simplify uh, our organizations, our governments, make the, the, the communication we do uh, much, much clearer. So maybe the citizen is our competitor and not the other DG or, or, or the other focus area between economy and connect and, and, and emploi, which maybe we see still today and was referred to 5G. 5G, the discussion we had around 5G was also showing that these discussions are showing the limits of our democracy because at one hand, we have a fantastic technology who can help to boost not only the economy, but also our social offering delivered to the society. We can do fantastic helps. We can do fantastic e-inclusion. We can do fantastic proactive um, services to, to our citizens. But on the other hand, we are blocked because somewhere there may be one person who is not agreeing. So we need also to, to redefine, I think in 2020, our way of working. The first speaker talk, talked about uh, we need guidance, we need roles. Um, sometimes I say, say in my organization, if you have too many roles, then you kill innovation. And what we need now is maybe a little bit, I need to have leadership, not of controlling, but I need, I need a leadership of trusting. Trust organizations, trust some societies that they can also have the possibility to invent. And I think in that way, that's why I was changing the question a little bit, is technology really a challenge or is it a huge opportunity? I think maybe like we were doing yesterday, we are focusing a lot on the challenges, but maybe not enough on the opportunities. And to end up AI, yes, AI has a lot of challenges and, and they have been expressed very clearly. But on the other hand, we can help a lot of people by using AI. Um, so how can we communicate in a positive way towards the different member states? That's what happening in, in the last elections we've seen. Communication is guiding citizens. And communication is influencing the democracy. That's our, that's our interpretation. It's not a reality, but that's our interpretation. So the, 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 the most important aspect is work on your communication. Do it in a coherent way with very simple messages. Give a little bit of trust to the people that they can use the technology really to help to build society. My kids and my grandchildren, what I would be proud of. That was a very passionate statement. Um, <laughs> uh, trust but verify, I think, is, is the maybe the answer to this but um yeah I, I would like to uh, just one question to Saskia here when you say communicating well who, who should do this communicating uh obviously uh, the corporate sector itself uh because you talked about clients and citizens but uh, i mean are you calling upon public institutions are you calling upon uh, the old and civil society to help you in communicating your message? No, I think we first need to define what we want to communicate. And, and I think if, we, if, you're, if you're not aligned in the communication, and I sometimes had uh, DGs saying something else because of the priorities of difference. So I think between the European entity as a whole, they need to decide what kind of communication do we want to get out. 
And if you are very clear, then there is one issue that I discovered uh, is that there is a difference between somebody with a reference to four to five years. If you really want to help the, the democracy to survive, we will not be capable to do it in, in this period. We will need to take actions today, which maybe will be for the next team winning the next elections. Let's also say what I said, the local government, maybe you will, maybe you will lose the short term elections. But you need to work on messages, clear messages, that can be repeated. And that is the responsibility of everybody. It's also the responsibility of the media, by the way. I'm not excluding anybody when I'm, when I'm pointing out. But I think in a moment of crisis, which we could say that we are living in for the moment, um, communication is one of, the, one of the aspects that may not be forgotten. And we are working a lot on policies and a lot of very good recovery funds and initiatives, etc. But what is our main message that we want to get out there? Yes, thank you very much, Saskia. Uh, we have a few minutes left before we turn to Q&A. Uh, so I'd like to return to our first speaker, Claudia. Um, maybe could you, do you have a response to especially the, the, the comments on free speech, also on the, you know, communicating more the opportunities than the challenges uh, of our two last speakers. Would you like to come in on this with a yep. minute? With, with pleasure, but let me first return to a common thread that we uh, we had with the, with the fellow speakers, which is rules and what rules and rules are rules and who sets the rules. For me, that's the fundamental question. At the Council of Europe, we spend larger than the EU, we're 47 member states. At the Council of Europe, this question has been very clearly uh, set for the year ago. Our committee of ministers has asked us to, um, to look into the possibility of, of a binding treaty. So not only rules, but the possibility of a binding treaty, binding of course the 47 member states, but open to US, to Mexico, Israel. We have many observers working with us. Um, so we are looking into this. For us, there is no question that AI applications need to be ruled. Like any new technology, that can be harmful. Imagine if we didn't have rules for the uh, very, very newest aviation technologies. I mean, we would have planes colliding. I mean, this is a very sophisticated new technology that does need rules. And uh, no, innovation is not stopped by rules. It is actually take, it can take comfort because companies can much more comfortably and freely uh, work and sell across borders if they know that they have the same the same rules. So we are uh, looking into this. Uh, we're in the middle of this process. Uh, I welcome all you all to look into a website. We have a new committee that is uh, composed of member states, but also of tech companies, of NGOs. Facebook is part of it uh, as well. And we're looking into what kind of rules. We're speaking here about very fundamental protection of democracy and human rights, as I said. This is the core business of the Council of Europe. So this is what we focus on. What are those fundamental rules that member states should abide by as they apply uh, AI, automatic uh, decision-making systems? Uh, so this is what we're looking at. So for us, the question is, is not a question anymore. It's a clear answer. Now, what kind of rules? I cannot tell you whether states would definitely agree to a, the treaty, whether this treaty will have enforcing mechanisms, what kind of mechanisms. But it is clear also from what uh, Mark Zuckerberg has said himself lately, he's looking for rules himself. It cannot be left to the companies to find uh, how AI is applied to, to the citizens. So that's the first point. On the second point uh, about the communication and, and uh, what should be the message, well, the message should be that uh, citizens should be able to rely again on strong institutions that would defend them on strong rule of law, on uh, justice systems that are independent. For me, that is a fundamental message. And they know that at the end of the day, the tech companies are not going to solve that for them. So as I said, there is, a, there is an intimate connection between reinforcing traditional institutions. Look at the US vote now uh, and the contestation. Uh, what do they turn to? Judges, ultimately. So we have to make sure that the belief of citizens and the trust that citizens have in those institutions uh, is not eroded. And so the, 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 the new enabling uh, comp tech companies that do enable, so there I agree with the last speaker, we should emphasize the positive they bring, but they must help reinforce the trust in the traditional institutions. Because without that trust, 
companies may not want to invest if they, if they don't, can, you cannot rely on, on, on very independent courts. And citizens will not turn up to the poll anymore if they don't believe they can trust the systems. So there is a, a very close connection between those two systems. And of course, the cornerstones of that, you have said, is freedom of expression. Um, that, of course, must be, uh, must be upheld. Uh, of course, bad uh, crimes, hate crimes, and crimes that, again, must be defined. So you always have to have a balance between very clear protected rights that must be clearly protected and of course the freedoms that enable our citizens to keep, keep trusting in the institutions we we have thank you so much claudia uh, just one question to anna herald um you know we've talked a lot about regulation the public debate is often very much about regulation but what about the other end of the spectrum, so to speak, of, of instruments. What about building resilience, reinforcing resilience, using education to make people more immune to hate speech and uh, mis uh, disinformation? How, uh, as, a, as a commission representative, how do you see the balance between the two? Or, or should we just say, oh, we do both? Thank you. Thank you, Rodney. It's a question. And in fact, it was one of these issues that, that, but probably wasn't so apparent in our discussions because we, we focus so much on making sure, you know, we have clear rules for the players. No, and certainly Europe has an ambition to lead the way uh, uh, in, you know, very clear, uh, close dialogue with, with, uh, with those players because we, you know, we have very good experience uh, as regards, in particular. Um, co-regulatory approaches. Um, so, but coming to, to, to your specific question about then you know, equipping actually the citizens then to interact uh, properly with what is at their disposal, no? Because one thing is to make sure, um, uh, you know, that, that, that the players, you know, do a lot of things, but another thing is indeed to empower citizens. And in a way, if you look at our discussions that we are now having, on the you know in shaping the 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 type of obligations uh, uh, and rules under the digital services act but also uh, about you know big pillars that we are discussing for the democracy action plan which revolve clearly around this big topic of elections integrity having you know functioning and free media and of course doing more on this information it's a lot about empowering citizens in the you know the, the discussions on the regulation itself if you think about one important part of possible obligations we are contemplating uh, in the discussion the, the dsa which is about transparency accountability for the content recommender system so the algorithmic transparency in a way it is not nothing else than giving the empowering citizens you know understand why certain information is arriving to them how it is presented to them and giving them possibly choices to do something about it you know i don't think there is a how should i put it we don't we shouldn't maybe see the world in in you know, compartments this is regulation and this is empowering citizens. I think within regulation, you can have elements that will then empower citizens. In other example, in the new audiovisual rules, we have a clear obligation for video sharing platforms, so for certain platforms. Uh, and by the way, also, you know, the, the, the any type of obligations that we might contemplate under the DSA, of course, will also be, um, uh, will take into account the specific roles of certain big platforms. Uh, but in the AMSD, for all video sharing platforms, we are asking them to put in place certain um, tools to help users to interact better, you know, to make more informed choices. And we have seen a lot of these these tools and policies already put in place, but certainly more can be done. And this is something one of the you know one of the issues that we certainly will uh, will include in the upcoming um, upcoming. Um, projects uh, to work more you know on the basis of what we already have in the directive with the players so i come back to my favorite point that it cannot be done you know uh, simply by the government so maybe that's maybe my, my only nuancing point that because of the scale of certain players uh, i think we have all interest 
to 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 and also their understanding of the technology to work very closely together but within a clear framework where it is up still to the public institute they you know how they what sort of citizens they they they, they you know ideally uh, what sort of skills and tools would like their citizens uh, to give so you know maybe just two examples to say that uh, i couldn't agree more but i'm not necessarily seeing this sort of tools as, as you know as, as soft tools that have nothing to regulation i think in a way we see that they are becoming part of the of this regulatory and regulatory uh, design that we are uh, trying to develop together. And maybe one last word about communication. I think it was very, um, very, um, I, I really fully subscribe to what what, uh, what my uh, colleague from the Council of Europe, you know, so eloquently described in terms of, you know, objectives. And I take your point, Saskia, that we should be clear, but I think it's also quite um, uh, remarkable uh, that now the European institutions are so clear uh, ab about, I think, what also was very um, um, eloquently described by um, Mariette and her remarks about, you know, the defense of democracy, defense of the basis of our societies, rule of law. You know, I am myself, I'm Polish, so I have, you know, some very, very vague memory. How should I put it? Different type of media and different type of societies, you know, where, where uh, you know, still as a child, you know, I had to, you know, for a very short period, luckily, live in. And I think that this is quite amazing that we see, you know, the EU now coming very forcefully with, uh, you know, with uh, with um, uh, rule of law uh, report where we clearly set out issues, including media issues, and that we now, for the first time, are, um, you know, proudly uh, about to present a European democracy action plan. So, so in a way, you know, it's you're right that probably we should be clearer, but I think we are, you know, we are getting there, you know, in terms of, of, you know, what the message actually is, at least from the EU. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, let us turn to our, to, to our announcer, uh, Katerina, and ask her whether we have any questions from the audience. It's a very inspiring debate, and thank you all for being with us. Well, I am back as promised with, for the Q&A part, and yes, I have the question from uh, questions from our audience, and uh, I hope our guests will try to find the answers. So, the first question. As we see a rise in disinformation and populist rhetoric, should digital technologies become more regulated? And if so, who sets those standards while upholding our democratic values? So I'll ask for the answer, Saskia van Ufelen. Thank you. I'll do my utmost best, yeah, do my utmost best to, give, uh, to give an answer to that one. I think we need to take into consideration that it can help. I think the colleague has just talked about digital skills. Um, there is, there is uh, another word which has been mentioned now is ethics. And in, I'm linking digital skill and ethics because the ethical way on treating data is not a responsibility of a government or an institution. It is the responsibility of every citizen. So citizens at first start need to realize how they handle the data can have an impact on what we do with data will happen. And that has nothing to do with the technology, but it has to do with, with competence. So the ethical behavior of every everybody handling data is a digital skill for the future, which we should learn our youngsters mostly. Secondly, um, can tools um, uh, help? Is it the solution or problem. Um, I think that's why, why innovation is that important. Um, because we can create, depending on what the, what the problem in the society can be, we can use it and create a solution. Do we need to wait for that? No. But we will have to handle, going forward, the possible issues that it will create. And we are only talking today about the technologies we know. We just need to realize that if we really are going for a world where everything is connected and airports and airplanes and, and every car, 
that we in factories that we will have to talk also about how will we handle b2b data we have a lot talking about democracy we have a lot talking about gdpr and personal data i'm a bit worried that in a few years we will urgently start talking about business to business data but that will going forward that will be a real challenge uh, also in the aspect of democracy and it's not the same playing field as the, the discussions we are having uh, today, but it's certainly part of, uh, of the democracy, the new democracy going forward. Thank you very much. I'll pass the floor to Claudia Luciani. I'm also interested in your point of view. Well, I think uh, the colleagues have said it. Uh, I can only reinforce the message about the um, digital literacy, as we call it. Um, but that's not just only being familiar with uh, with the new technologies, it is understanding that that technology should uh, be used to make you a citizen, an alert citizen. So um, that must be cultivated. We're not born with skills. We're not born a Democrats. We learn through our life to become uh, active and uh, hopefully peaceful democratic citizens of this world. So I could not emphasize more the, uh, the importance of, of those skills from the aid at the Council of Europe a lot of uh, uh, means towards that end, notably with uh, ministers of education who understand this call very well. But it's not only a question of formal education, it's also a question of um, informal and other kinds of education. When it comes to the role of um, technology companies, uh, of course, they can themselves uh, create uh, their own uh, guide. Uh, they can take, you know, set up, this is one of our recommendations on it recently did on this information that the EU, by the way, used, uh, the European Union colleagues used quite a lot. Here, some of the recommendations are that uh, interna uh, technological companies can have their own international advisory council to uh, guide the technology companies uh, as they deal with uh, the information disorder and act as honest brokers. So the, the job is also for the companies. Um, the job is for citizens, the job is for uh, certainly governments, although they are again, we are of course for free speech, uh, therefore uh, expressions, from those expressions should be not regulated, but uh, I would say education, digital skills and, uh, and more uh, enhanced role for companies, that those would be to uh, immediate answers. Thank you very much. Well, let's go to another question we have here already. Do social media algorithms favor those with inflammatory views? The ability to react and reply to comments pushes them to making them the most visible. So I'll pass this question directly to Orasala. Algorithms and our platforms, of course, uh, the aim is to serve our our people, customers, and who uses our platforms the best possible way, so that they can find content that they actually enjoy. So if you are enjoying some sports or, or particular things on our platforms, our algorithms will fit those uh, more to you. Uh, and let me emphasize that in, in most and majority of the cases, it's only positive information that you will see in our platforms. But of course, uh, I can also tell that we are moving uh, 3 million pieces of hate speech from our platforms uh, every month, more or less. So um, what we have been talking about here, I would like to also emphasize that how we actually behave online and offline. I think that we all need, need to take some responsibility here because uh, what we do on internet or what we do offline, I think that we should be respectful for one another. And uh, our platforms are do, uh, doing our utmost to keep our platforms as enjoyable as possible because I can assure you that we don't want to see, for example, hate speech or, or harmful content on our platforms, it doesn't serve our communities, building communities or giving voices to people or even businesses to use our platforms. So our aim and goal is the same as uh, I think our democratic decision makers to keep our platforms as enjoyable as possible. And that's why also media literacy and digital literacy and people understanding how our platforms work uh, and also algorithms, how they work and transparency there, it's very important for us. 
that's why also my team in Brussels and in every member states, we are here to engage and learn and also tell how our algorithms work on our platforms. Thank you very much for, uh, for this complex uh, answer. And we'll go to another one. When will democratic countries be ready to a larger extent to introduce credible online election systems? So I'll ask uh, Anna Herald for her opinion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, it's uh, it's quite an important question, I have to say, yeah? because it sort of presupposes that we don't uh, have anything uh, online, as if, you know, online, the online world was immune, you know, to what we have built over the years um, uh, in terms of, you know, democratic processes. It is, will, it, this will be, in a way, uh, one of the common threads that we'll try to address uh, through the actions of the European Democracy Action Plan. Uh, just to quote one particular issue, which is um, among those that we are considering. If we uh, take, uh, let's say, the world of what we say established media, in many, many countries, European countries in particular, and not only, but of course I can speak for, for the EU because uh, these are the legal systems that, that, that we have certain knowledge about, uh, you know, have for years implemented rules on um, what we call a parity of treatment during elections, uh, um, moratoria on political activity during elections, rules on campaign polls, and so on and so forth. So, uh, and, in, and in particular, also rules that at least in, in a, you know, in a, in a big number of, of, of European countries, also ensured that there is a fair representation of political views during election periods. Um, this has worked very well on the traditional media. Uh, and I think that the challenge is to see is whether we can have anything that at least would serve a similar purpose so don't get me wrong, I'm not advocating, you know, for simple, you know, um, application of any rules that were created for a different environment to the online environment. But at least we have to ask ourselves the question. We are not saying that we do have an answer right now, but at least we have to be uh, able, you know, to ask ourselves difficult questions and try to provide answers. And again, I will come back to my favorite point uh, with the help of those uh, that in the end control those processes. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I'll pass the floor to to Mariette Shakia to uh, tell, uh, tell us your opinion on this online election. Well, it should be a goal in and of itself. Uh, and the most important thing is that elections are uh, verifiable. So people, even if they don't trust the system, can find ways to check on the system itself. Uh, in the Netherlands, one of the most uh, IT uh, advanced countries in the world, we start with a red pencil on a piece of paper. And uh, it works because people are more suspicious of an electronic or online voting system uh, than they are willing to give up, you know, this, this perhaps old fashioned, but very reliable, simple and uh, easily accessible mechanism. Also for people who not have the digital skills. So I would say that democratic integrity should be leading, not some kind of utopian view of what digitization might mean. Uh, and I think that, uh, that we have learned many painful lessons about how easily democracy can be attacked and destroyed if you leave it into private hands to, to govern the digital world or if you take democracy for granted. And, um, you know, there's plenty of examples, even in the hour we just spent discussing uh, where we can see uh, that the current momentum is a critical one. The status quo is, I think, unacceptable. And it's really important to start with democracy and then to look at what's necessary, and not to begin with a technology uh, to, to um, attach all kinds of hopes if you do not carefully look at what the incentives of different actors are. So um, a lot more to say, but I would say do not have unrealistic hopes of online voting and make sure that the system works. Thank you very much. Uh, we are unfortunately out of time, so I would like to thank you all for being. Sorry, sorry. Just a little point to add on. Yeah, yeah. Uh, my Go on. Sorry. That 
uh, indeed, we have uh, seen in the 47 member states that the question of online voting is indeed, as she was saying, not a solution. Many countries have adopted that and dropped it. It doesn't increase at all voter turnout. It is not uh, increasing young uh, people's uh, turnout. So indeed, uh, it should not be pursued as a as a goal in and for itself. In some countries, it facilitates operations, but it is used very seldom, though it has been available for a very, very long time. So not uh, a fundamental goal, uh, as, as, as Wright pointed out. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, last remarks from Claudia Luciani. And uh, well, I would like to thank you all and thank you for joining us today and have a nice day.